Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, October 30th, 2024. Let's get into it. And I can't say this any better than Elon Musk himself. Yes, this election is a fork in the road of destiny, and I'm going to add of all humanity. Okay? And we're going to get into that story later in the video uh, towards the end, and you can cut off right there. Obviously, I, I present viewpoints that you that I disagree with and that you probably disagree with, but I want to show you what the enemy, or who I consider the enemy, is saying. And sometimes they say, you know, that's the thing about Satan and the devil or whatever. Uh, you know, they always mix a bit of truth with uh, garbage, you know, uh, disin well, they call it disinformation, I call it bad information, or lies, mainly lies. So let's, uh, let's keep reading. The reason why I'm involved in politics this time is because this time it's a fork in the road. I think we're doomed if Trump doesn't win, so he's got to win. Now, does that tell you why uh, Elon Musk is there? And so we're going to talk about the dream team. I mean, we've got Elon. I mean, think about this. Okay, throughout history, you've got Aristotle. You've got uh, Ford. You've got Tesla. You've got uh, Einstein. Uh, I mean, all of the great minds, Newton, going back throughout history, you know, we always, you know, it's, 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 it's a rare happening in world history when you have five minds like Elon Musk, like Donald J. Trump, like Vivek Ramaswamy, like Tulsi Gabbard, and like, like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. They always, they all bring unique qualities to the plate to turn around the destiny of the United States and perhaps all of humanity. We are on the precipice of a world war. And in that, we all die in a nuclear holocaust. So, and also, even if the nuclear holocaust doesn't happen, I dare say the United States is going to cease to exist. If the Democrats get elected, okay, you've got, I mean, look at the people that were in Trump's administration. Mike Pompeo, uh, good Lord, you had... General Kelly, I mean, uh, all evil bastards. I mean, you, Mark Milley, I mean, that traitor. He's a freaking traitor. Uh, Austin, I, no, he wasn't in Trump's, I don't think he was in Trump's administration, but he was up there in the ranks. We've got nothing but traitors in the country right now. They all hate the United States. They want to see you and us uh, all fail. So this election means more than anything else. And But don't take my word for it. And that's why I talked about the great minds of the world. So I'm going to play at the beginning of this video, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson. If you're not familiar with him, uh, he is, he's on the level of Einstein in, in my mind. I mean, uh, he, he's one of the greatest minds. He, he's out of, out, of, out of Canada of all places. Canada actually, because they didn't want to listen to his, uh, his opinion on things, or his, he refused to bow down to the man. And uh, so he ended up moving to the United States, and now he's even talking about how important this election is to you and me. But don't, don't listen to me. You know, I'm just a dummy. You know, I'm, I'm one of the dumbest dumb people on the planet. <laughs> you know, I admit that. You know, I just I didn't make these videos because I'm trying to help the world in some fashion. And as I, I snoop around and, and learn from other people, which mainly I do, uh, you know, I want to get back to my life. I want to have a cybersecurity business. I want to put up a website. I want to sell t-shirts. I want to do anything besides make these videos. But I think that, like Elon said, we are on the precipice of annihilation or our salvation. Let's watch Jordan Peterson now. On to Elon himself. First and foremost, the world's premier engineer and inventor is a man clearly and demonstrably capable of doing six impossible things at the same time. This speaks primarily of his intelligence. Musk is exceptionally one in a billion high in general cognitive ability and openness, a true genius, albeit in the technical manner. That is an observation, not a criticism. With regard to personality, he's not particularly extroverted, tilting, I would say, in the opposite direction, although not exceptionally so. He is moderate in neuroticism, carrying a fair burden of depression-like pain with him, not least because of a truly rough childhood 
which he alludes to, but does not make a show of. There is some withdrawal there, run roughshod over by his brilliance and openness, and also some volatility evidenced in his behavior on X online, somewhat reminiscent of Trump himself. Musk is also a worker and manager, hard and dedicated, far beyond the norm, so exceptionally high in conscientiousness and agreeable enough, particularly on the compassionate side, to be very pro-human. He is, however, no pushover, is not particularly polite and can and does make the difficult judgments of discrimination that allow him to continually operate and maintain multiple extremely large, demanding, stunningly diverse, and truly cutting-edge enterprises. His staggering intelligence and business acumen means that he brings something near miraculous to the Trump X-Men team. I would vote for Trump as president if I could vote, and I can't because I'm Canadian, and forgive me for that. Just because Musk has agreed to play a role in any new administration that Trump might bring about, he has even wittily proposed to head up a new Department of Governmental Efficiency, a phrase whose initials, D-O-G-E, indicate the willingness in an inside joke manner to do only good every day, as well as signifying a bemused but knowing dog whose image has become a widespread meme. It has been my diligent and hopeful observation that Musk is a good man, or at least a terrible, complicated man, trying very hard to be good, which is all we could truly hope if we were the least bit realistic about human nature and our own prospects. Could Musk do to the American deep state what he did for Twitter? Could he prune and cut so the Republic could revitalize? Stranger things have happened in the course of human history. Javier Milai is trying something similarly demanding in Argentina. And the US of A has a remarkable capacity to reinvent itself. Someone like Musk playing a key role in the governance of the greatest show on earth is a once in a lifetime opportunity. That's an adventure by anyone's standards. I have met with the next member of this group in question Mr. Robert F. Kennedy, five times, speaking with and listening to him at some length each time. He has the near manic energy and loquaciousness of those with exceptional verbal intelligence and the intensely focused concentration that pushes people who have that proclivity beyond even their own limits in pursuit of a goal. He's dreadfully well-informed, a veritable master of historical minutiae in a manner nonetheless relevant to today's concerns. He is also someone who, like Trump and Musk, can and does draw the overall picture accurately. And even in a somewhat prophetic manner, he is fearless and dedicated, having stood up and successfully against even the largest giants of the proto-fascist modern state and has single-handedly drawn public attention to what is genuinely a health crisis of gargantuan proportions, despite its invisibility on the political stage until the current time. He's also someone once bitten, twice shy, a seriously wounded apostate, again, like Trump and Musk, as well as Tulsi Gabbard, from his own original favored party, the Democrats. When I first spoke with Mr. Kennedy on my YouTube channel, I asked him the same question I always ask the many Democrat leaders I have spoken with, most privately, unwilling as they generally are to risk being seen in public with the likes of me. The question, when do you think the left goes too far? His answer to that in interview one, at the very beginning of his presidential march? I'm trying to run a campaign that brings people together rather than a campaign that tries, you know, that is based upon, you know, that kind of tribalism of condemning people for ideologies that I don't necessarily agree with. I had my doubts about the suitability of that answer in the long run, having experienced precisely what happens when the left goes too far in my own private and personal life. Nonetheless, on that occasion, I let 
the question lie. I can tell you, however, that Mr. Kennedy had plenty to say on that topic when we spoke on YouTube on our second occasion. The erstwhile Democrat contender for president had, by that time, experienced running hard and headlong into precisely what I had intimated in the form of my initial and purposefully leading question. In consequence, Robert F. detailed for at least an hour his utter dismay with the power-mad, corrupt, ideologically possessed shenanigans of the progressive left, the very force that could continue its current domination of the public discourse and scene if Ms. Kamala Harris and the shadowy and unknown forces behind her ascent to power manage to maintain their positions come November. What is Kennedy like as a personality? Extroverted, like Trump, although perhaps not as much so. Trump is hard to equal, let alone top, in that regard. Not without his pain and negative emotion, like Musk. Not too agreeable, although not at all narcissistic. Despite his markedly forceful assertiveness in opinion and as a speaker, this was evidenced, not least by my comparative silence, particularly during our second YouTube discussion. I'm a very talkative, verbally assertive person, for better or worse. But Mr. Kennedy had the stage for the vast majority of our time together. That was as it should be, in my opinion, given the circumstances, but it is still something that does not happen to me very often, even when I intend it to. But there is even more on the table, as there are more remarkable actors involved. The last time I saw Tulsi Gabbard was in DC during a discussion hosted in this strangest of all possible worlds by Russell Brand. I had spoken with her at length, as in the case of Kennedy, on my podcast, although only once. What is Lieutenant Colonel Gabbard like on the personality side? Moderately extroverted, higher in assertiveness than enthusiasm. She is no giggling girl. Perhaps her military experience mitigated against taking that sometimes charming, but often too easy route. Markedly low in neuroticism, as befits a woman who pursued a true military career. Agreeableness? Ms. Gabbard cares genuinely about those she served and continues to serve, although I would say she does so in the temperamentally conservative manner that is part patriotism and part respect for the intrinsic dignity and worth of every person, rather than in the oft cloying, false, and morally self-righteous manner that so often characterizes the so-called allies of the oppressed. On the side of the progressive left, she's also very smart, without the more showy brilliance of Ramaswamy, who we still have to discuss, down to earth in that intelligence, and is as conscientious as you would hope an ex-military member and influential political leader might be. Gabbard is the sort of woman who would make of someone a favorite aunt, a close confidant, a trusted friend, if you wanted sane advice, she'd be your pick. She doesn't have the stunning entrepreneurial flair of Musk, Kennedy, or Ramaswamy, but her presence on the X-Men team would add to that excess of plasticity some true stability, the other personality metatrait. This is particularly important when the team in question will be tasked with so much administrative and managerial responsibility. It is great to have someone around like Vivek, for example, who spins off new ideas at a constant rate. But I'd bet on Gabbard to implement effectively and to pay attention to all the details, although Musk also excels at that, to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. She's a very difficult person not to admire not to feel lesser than in her presence. She's solid, competent, straightforward, admirable, brave, patriotic, and tough. She'd be a truly thoughtful presence in the Trump X-Men team, which might otherwise tilt too hard toward the entrepreneurial and revolutionary. Slow down, gentlemen. Take some time and think.
She has as well the emotional resilience not to panic, even under pressure, not to claim that the sky is falling and rush around madly and counterproductively merely for the show of work. It doesn't hurt as well that she is the epitome of feminine grace and attractiveness. Wonder Woman indeed, borrowing, if we can, from the DC world, the comic books, and not the city. I could certainly envision her as the first truly deserving female president of the United States. This brings us to one Vivek Ramaswamy. He and I recorded a number of podcasts, which I greatly enjoyed. That started before he was running for office, when we discussed another notable accomplishment, the establishment of his Strive Asset Management Fund, designed to give investors an alternative to the mongers of ESG, stakeholder capitalism, who are doing everything they can to sneak a particularly pernicious form of top-down, centrally planned socialism into the free market system. So they can pretend to be virtuous in a manner hypothetically unlike their greedy by implication peers. Not long after embarking on his daring campaign for president, Vivek began a habit of approximately quarterly appearances on my YouTube channel. That effort, despite its unlikelihood, given his unknown status as a political contender, unfolded very successfully, bringing both the candidate and his ideas to a wide public audience and proving his credibility as a young and rising alternative on the political scene. What can I say about Vivek's personality? He is extroverted, both on the assertive and enthusiastic side, characterized by more positive emotion overall than anyone else we have discussed. He's also very high in openness, both to ideas and, as far as I could tell, on the artistic cultural side, although perhaps more the former than the latter. He shares those traits with Trump, Musk, and Kennedy, although less so, although she is still far above average in such regard than Gabbard. He's more polite than Trump, certainly, more measured in his speech, less rough and provocative, although also less witty, although certainly not dull. I would hazard a guess as well that he is less compassionate and people-centered than both Trump and Musk. Ramaswamy tends to stay in the realm of ideas and is clearly motivated on the political side, primarily by intellectual curiosity as well as the desire to see things done better. He appears low in neuroticism and is highly stress tolerant as those are the same thing. Unlikely to withdraw like Trump, less depressive than Musk or Kennedy, but also less volatile than Trump, quite stable temperamentally on the emotional side. That's a good feature in a crisis as noted in the case of Gabbard. I suspect he is high in conscientiousness as well particularly on the side of industriousness, which is half that trait, the other half being orderliness. Ramaswamy is very successful for a comparatively young man, and he has done that in consequence of his own efforts. This is not a fate that befalls people who fail to work dreadfully hard. Cautions with regard to Vivek? Mostly to do with his youth. Mr. Ramaswamy is accustomed to being the smartest person in the room and, perhaps, the most successful. This gives him a certain brashness. When I watched him in the first round of the Republican primaries, for example, he was the candidate who received the most positive responses from the audience, as well as the most negative. The same was true, arguably, of his compatriots on the stage. I thought he risked in his provocative but undeniably interesting approach some unnecessary enmity from those same people. And it is not clear to me that this was a good long-term strategy, given the high possibility of sharing a bed with at least some of them, metaphorically speaking, in the future. I would say that as his campaign progressed, he became more moderate and careful in his criticism of his fellow Republicans, but also more measured overall in his utterances. This is a sign of someone humble enough to learn despite his confidence. And that is a good thing. He is, above all, like Musk, Kennedy, and Gabbard, cognitively gifted. 
And that is also a good thing. Complex jobs require highly intelligent people to manage them. This is true of any job where the demands constantly shift and governance at the highest level certainly qualifies. Trump, Musk, Kennedy, Gabbard, Ramaswamy, Vance, that's a dream team by the standards of anyone looking for a wild and compelling show. God only knows what, with that same God's help, they could accomplish. Every single one of those people is remarkable in their own right. Everyone, a person whom it has been a privilege to watch, hear, and to some degree, get to know. It is for such reasons, for what it is worth, that I hereby and wholeheartedly endorse the Trump. Hi, I'm Seth Dillon, CEO of the Babylon Bee. While other fake news organizations like the Washington Post and the LA Times refuse to save democracy, we here at the Babylon Bee are proud to do our part. Today, we've decided to officially endorse communist Her <clears throat> Kamala Harris for president. Why Kamala? Well, we'd be here all day if I listed all the reasons, but I'll name a few. To begin with, she shot straight to the top because of her intellect. Smart lady. She's the first person in history to win a primary without receiving a single vote. That's impressive. She's a person of color. Indian, I think. She's a phenomenon. She gave Drew Barrymore a hug, an act that symbolized her willingness to wrap her arms around the country and give us all a hug whenever Republicans make us feel sad. She was such a popular vice president that over 12 million people hiked hundreds of miles to cross our southern border to vote for her without ID in this election. She has a melodic and soothing voice, especially when she laughs. I can listen to her laugh for hours. Most importantly, though, she is not Donald Trump. Wow. How can you put into words the greatness that is Kamala Harris? She reminds us to look forward to what can be, unburdened by what has been. And she understands, perhaps better than anyone else, the significance of the passage of time. She knows, as all wise leaders do, that there is great significance to the passage of time. Each minute that passes takes us from the present into the future. We're only here, right now, in this moment, because other moments, like the one that just went by, have passed. What could be more significant than that? We are grateful that when America is on the brink of losing its democracy, the person standing strong against the looming threat of fascism as a woman is accomplished, intelligent, joyful, and non-white as Kamala Harris. And so we join Eminem, Megan Thee Stallion, the Insane Clown Posse, and many other great thought leaders by proudly endorsing Kamala Harris for president. Okay, now I know that was tough, man. That was 16 minutes of watching Jordan Peterson. But I thought that that was the most important thing for the video. And so then I wanted to get a clip because I'm still in awe of what took place in Madison Square Garden. To me, that was the greatest political... Well, a lot of people say it wasn't political. And of course, the, the, the Democrats or the mainstream media, they're calling it a Nazi function. Now... I just want you to watch this from RFK Jr. Does this sound like a Nazi to you? Does this sound like Hitler up there, you know, saying, we got to take over the world, we got to exterminate the Jews? No, this is RFK at Madison Square Garden, and I've put up other videos about this. Let's just watch him. Don't you think that we deserve a president in this country who's going to restore the moral authority of the United States of America? Don't you think that we deserve a president who's going to end the warfare state and rebuild the middle class. Oh, you want a president who's going to put America first? Oh, you want a president who's going to protect our children? And who's going to protect women's sports? And who's going to stop dividing this country along racial lines? And don't you want a president who's going to end the corruption at the federal agencies, at FDA, at NIH, at CDC, and at the CIA. And don't you want a president who's going to make America healthy again? <laughs> and 
And don't you want a president who's going to make America great again? And we need to go to the polls on November 5th and vote for Donald Trump. God bless you and God bless America. Okay, so that was RFK Jr. Uh, so now, I, you know, and, and I hate to say it, I mean, a lot of this video, if you want to cut off right here, you probably should. I wanted to say, um, okay, so this this is, you know, some, we got a lot of cheating going on. So I wanted to get this out. I was talking to a buddy of mine, and, and it turns out these were legitimate ballots, but did they push them off the back of the truck intentionally? Not good. Someone found a box full of ballots and other documents on exit 11 at the intersection of 20, 211th Street in Cutler Bay, Florida. He immediately picked them up and took them to the police station where they have been properly secured. No information yet on who's responsible or how they got there. If this is happening in Florida, imagine what's happening in Detroit, Philly, and Atlanta. So yeah, there's a huge amount of cheating going on right now across the country, mainly, I would imagine, in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan. Uh, you know, they are trying to steal the election. I mean, why, why else? You know, what sane person would not want voter ID except a Democrat? Okay, I, I want a free and fair election, you know, I, and that's why I want voter ID. But the Democrats, obviously, I mean, it's right in your face. You know that if you, don't, if you don't want voter ID, you're obviously trying to cheat on the election. And that's the only way they can cheat. But, you know, anyway, so I just wanted to put that story out. Uh, so now we're going to get into the second half of the video. And you probably might want to cut the video off right here because I'm going to get into Israel. And I'm going to present this from an, uh, well, they would call it anti-Semitic. Uh, but I'm going to just present it from, from a pro-Palestinian position. And a lot of Christians, a lot of Americans, they don't want to hear all this. And so you can cut off right here. But uh, let's, uh, let's, let's just take a couple of things. Douglas McGregor, let's make something abundantly clear. Everyone in the world views Anthony Blinken as Netanyahu's point man. And that's exactly what he is. Our government has been hijacked and there's no one up there governing much of anything. Now, if you recall, I put out a video uh, not too long ago that said that not Netanyahu and Israel rules the United States. And they do. They bought Congress. They bought the Biden administration. Of course, China owns a portion of the Biden administration. So, you know, but then let's get into the, the meat of the second half of the video here. So now we're going to say uh, break in Douglas McGregor, chairman of Israel's Yasral uh, Bite in You Party, Aldor Lieberman reveals significant losses. We have lost about 800 soldiers in the fighting and we have about 11,000 wounded. So don't think the Israelis aren't taking big losses uh, in their fight against Hezbollah. And that's what that's all about. And, uh, you know, I wish I had McGregor's connections, but he's just talking about that. Um, so anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's get into the next portion. So we got a video here. And this is from Adam. Palestine is the only country on earth without the right to resist occupation, land theft, ethnic cleansing, and the genocide of their people. And uh, this is a woman speaking. I don't even know who she is, but she makes a good point. Let's watch that video now. Not the same. Like, Israel is an oppressive colonizing force. It was a state that was created on top of an indigenous land that was full of people. And the foundation of Israel was ethnically cleansing that indigenous population. And the continuous growth of Israel is predicated on the continuous ethnic cleansing and expulsion of those people. So, you know, for me, um, looking at Palestinians who are constantly subjugated, brutalized, humiliated in the West Bank. Three million Palestinians live under this brutal military occupation that's akin to a fascist military dictatorship. And then in Gaza, of course, you're living under brutal medieval siege where you're occupied militarily by the outside. So for me, looking at millions of people who are denied basic human rights, living under an apartheid system, living under brutal military occupation, to me, that those are victims. Those are victims of policies that are horrific crimes against humanity. There is no both sides in that issue. Um, is, Israelis are free to go wherever they want. 
Um, a lot of Israelis aren't from Israel. They're, they're from other Western nations or whatever. I mean, we know that right of return, you can be a, a Jewish person anywhere in the world and just move to Israel. Um, you can ethnically cleanse a Palestinian village and move to Israel and move right there and, and be, um, you know, be aided and embedded by the state. So for me, it is a question of just simple morals. I, I, I have extreme moral righteousness when I look at an issue like Israel-Palestine because it's just so obviously naked. Um, and, you know, when we look back, like if we look at something like October 7th and, you know, um, on the Piers Morgan show and, you know, we spent 10 minutes of this so-called debate where he's just basically demanding that I condemn Hamas. And for me, it, you're getting into a tricky situation where you're being asked to condemn people who are living under an oppressive system. We're not even talking about the atrocities or crimes that were committed on October 7th. I'm just talking about the actual both sides of Israel and Hamas. And, and there's just no comparison whatsoever, Ryan. And when we look back at the Nat Turner slave rebellion hundreds of years ago, no one has asked is this a moral issue? You know, it's so obvious. It's like you're not going to condemn the slaves for revolting. You can talk historically about why atrocities were committed or why some things happened the way that they did, but you would never condemn the slaves for breaking out of their shackles. Okay, so that was her on that. And so then we get into a, a nice video that uh, Novus, let's see, where is it at here? Uh, not N O C T I S Noctis Draven, and he put together this animation. Uh, I tell you what, I can't imagine how people put together these animations, but it just kind of depicts what's been taking place in northern Gaza as the Israelis exterminate the Palestinians. And you say, Oh no, that cybersecurity guy, it's not an extermination. Yes, it is, it's a genocide. Let's watch that animation. I thought it was pretty cool. So the video here, this is Bernie Sanders. Now, sometimes, you know, we have to show people that we don't agree with, but agree with on certain points. And so Bernie actually came out and he talked about the genocide that's taken place in Gaza. And he does a good job talking. I mean, he's a politician, man. I mean, you have to admit the guy's... He's been in public office longer than I've been alive. <laughs> he's, he's older than dirt, man. Uh, and, and to be able to do that, you got to be somewhat smart and articulate in what you're saying. And so I wanted to put up his entire video. It's, it's six minutes of torture. Uh, so if you want to watch it, but, you know, I've got friends that say, you know, that cybersecurity guy, all you present is one side. You don't ever, you know, show what the Democrats are saying or what they're what they're doing. And so I wanted to put up Bernie Sanders because I agree with what he's saying about Gaza, but I want you to notice how he twists everything towards the backside of the video. And he and he wants to depict, you know, MAGA Republicans as, as the enemy and how, you know, what the, you know, his, his comments are very divisive and they divide the nation. Anyway, Let's just finish off the video right there. Let's watch Bernie Sanders. I understand that there are millions of Americans who disagree with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris on the terrible war in Gaza. I am one of them. While Israel had a right to defend itself against the horrific Hamas terrorist attack of October 7th, which killed 1,200 innocent people and took 250 hostages, it did not have the right to wage an all-out war against the entire Palestinian people. It did not have the right to kill 42,000 Palestinians, two-thirds of whom were children, women, and the elderly, or injure over 100,000 people in Gaza. It did not have the right to destroy Gaza's infrastructure, housing, and healthcare system. It did not have the right to bomb every one 
of Gaza's 12 universities. It did not have the right to block humanitarian aid, causing massive malnutrition in children and, in fact, starvation. And that is why I am doing everything I can to block U.S. military aid and offensive weapons sales to the right-wing extremist Netanyahu government in Israel. And I know that many of you share those feelings. And some of you are saying, how can I vote for Kamala Harris if she is supporting this terrible war? And that is a very fair question. And let me give you my best answer. And that is that even on this issue, Donald Trump and his right-wing friends are worse. In the Senate, in Congress, the Republicans have worked overtime to block humanitarian aid to the starving children in Gaza. The president and vice president both support getting as much humanitarian aid into Gaza as soon as possible. Trump has said Netanyahu is doing a good job and has said Biden is holding him back. He has suggested that the Gaza Strip would make excellent beachfront property for development. And it is no wonder Netanyahu prefers to have Donald Trump in office. But even more importantly, and this I promise you, after Kamala wins, we will together do everything that we can to change U.S. policy toward Netanyahu. An immediate ceasefire, the return of all hostages, a surge of massive humanitarian aid, the stopping of settler attacks on the West Bank, and the rebuilding of Gaza for the Palestinian people. And let me be clear, we will have, in my view, a much better chance of changing U.S. policy with Kamala than with Trump, who is extremely close to Netanyahu and sees him as a like-minded, right-wing extremist ally. But let me also say this, and I deal with this every single day as a U.S. Senator. As important as Gaza is, and as strongly as many of us feel about this issue, it is not the only issue at stake in this election. If Trump wins, women in this country will suffer an enormous setback and lose the ability to control their own bodies. That is not acceptable. If Trump wins, to be honest with you, the struggle against climate change is over. While virtually every scientist who has studied the issue understands that climate change is real and an existential threat to our country and the world, Trump believes it is a hoax. And if the United States, the largest economy in the world, stops transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel, every other country, China, Europe, all over the world, they will do exactly the same thing. And God only knows the kind of planet we will leave to our kids and future generations. If Trump wins at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, he will demand even more tax breaks for the very richest people in our country while cutting back on programs that working families desperately need. The rich will only get richer while the minimum wage will remain at $7.25 an hour and millions of our fellow workers will continue to earn starvation wages. Did you all see the recent Trump rally at Madison Square Garden? Well, I did. And what I can tell you is that as a nation, as all of you know, we have struggled for years against impossible odds to try to overcome all forms of bigotry, whether it is racism, whether it's sexism, whether it's homophobia, whether it's xenophobia, you name it. We have tried to fight against bigotry. But that is exactly what we saw on display at that unbelievable Trump rally. It was not a question of speakers getting up there disagreeing with Kamala Harris on the issues. That wasn't the issue at all. They were attacking her simply because she was a woman and a woman of color. Extreme, vulgar sexism and racism. Is that really the kind of America that we can allow? So let me conclude by saying this. This is the most consequential election in our lifetimes. Many of you have differences of opinion with Kamala Harris on Gaza. So do I. But we cannot sit this election out. Trump has got to be defeated. 
Let's do everything we can in the next week to make sure that Kamala Harris is our next president. Thank you very much. I think this is the most important election ever. We have to get Trump and the dream team elected. Um, if not, you know, well, my life's done. Obviously, I won't be able to start my business. I'll be censored. Uh, you'll never see me again. Uh, it's, my guns will be stolen by the Democrats. Uh, the Second Amendment, the Constitution will cease to exist and I uh, will no longer be a free nation. That's my honest belief. Peace out. Stay free. All right, so that's it for the video. Uh, I guess I can't say no more. Peace out and stay free.